water dominates our life. Without it, we cannot live. About 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. Oceans, rivers, lakes, marshes, streams, ponds, of all that water, only 3% of it is fresh. 70% of that fresh water is locked up in glaciers and icebergs at this time. A glacier is a long river of ice that is formed on land and moves in response to gravity. It is formed when years of ice and snow pack build up in mountainous or sloping terrain. Glaciers contain the most fresh water on Earth and are only behind oceans for largest amount of total water, but humans cannot access most of it. An iceberg is a part of a glacier that is broken off and is floating in open water. 27% of the fresh water that is left is in groundwater and aquifers, while a 3% of fresh water that is left is above the surface. That is only one thousandth of the Earth's fresh water that you can see above the surface in lakes, rivers, and reservoirs. Even including surface water and aquifers, there is little water available to living things. That's why the knowledge about water we are about to share with you is so important. The water cycle is water's shift from solid to liquid to gas and back again. This activity will show the class acting out the three states of water, which are solid, liquid, and gas, how they move, and how well you can see them. In ice, the solid form of water, the water molecules are frozen in place, but because of the unique way water solidifies, ice is less dense than its liquid form. Because the molecules are frozen in place, they have to move as a group, and this makes them easy to see. When ice melts into water, a liquid form, its molecules have some individual movement, meaning they can move on their own a little bit, but still must move as a group to go any distance. It is a little harder to see than ice because it moves a lot. The molecules are moving faster, but are more dense than ice. When water evaporates from a liquid form to a gas, it becomes invisible because the molecules are moving so quickly that they can't be seen. Because they are so light and they are hot, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 degrees Celsius, they rise into the sky and drift apart. Evaporation is the conversion of liquid to gas. Evaporation rates, or how much evaporates during a set period of time, change when the weather is sunny, windy, raining, or cloudy. When it is windy, a lot of water evaporates because the wind blows away the air that is saturated with water molecules and more water can evaporate into the new drier air. When water heats up to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, the top layer of molecules boils and that heats up the rest of the water, helping it to evaporate. The sun is the usual source of heat for this process. In cool, dark places, Little water evaporates because of lack of heat and sunlight to start the process. Almost no water evaporates under a cup because the air becomes quickly saturated with molecules and cannot hold any more water. So that was a simple summary of evaporation and water vapor. If you want more information, you can try the internet, but be sure you trust your source. Condensation is the process of water vapor, an invisible gas, becoming a liquid. Condensation happens when water vapor cools down. When there is too much water vapor in the air, it becomes humid. Humidity is the amount of water vapor found in the air. Warm air holds more water vapor than cold air. The reason dew appears on the ground by morning is because of a sudden temperature drop during the night. The colder air can't support as much water vapor and the vapor condenses on the grass. Frost occurs from an even colder temperature drop during the night. When it gets cold enough for the water vapor not just to condense into a liquid, but actually freeze into a solid, 
So now you're thinking, what about clouds? They show us condensation all year round, even when it's not cold. But it is cold up there in the atmosphere. Clouds are formed when water vapor condenses on tiny particles. You might have thought that there was nothing up there in clouds except water. But there are particles of dust and elemental pollution. These invisible particles form the building blocks of clouds. So why are clouds up there and not down here? That's because particles high up in the sky are super cold, so water can condense on them more quickly and easily. Plus, clouds can actually be down here when conditions are right. Fog is a cloud sitting almost on top of the ground. Also, mist forms above lakes and ponds because of oversaturated air near the water's surface. The reason this happens is because the air above the water becomes so full of water vapor that it can't hold anymore. So after evaporation in the water cycle comes condensation where water vapor becomes a liquid once more. Everyone knows what precipitation is but you just might not recognize the word precipitation. Precipitation is when water comes down from the sky. You probably know it as any of these four forms. Rain, sleet, hail, or snow. Snow is frozen water droplets in the form of crystals that fall during the winter. Hail is completely frozen droplets that are hard and small, sort of like tiny balls of ice, and hail can fall at any time of year. Sleet is hail mixed with rain, like a thick slush but sleet only happens in wintertime. Rain is just droplets of water that can fall at any time of year. When enough water vapor has condensed, it forms water droplets that fall back to Earth in the four types of precipitation. When it rains, gravity pulls water downhill, causing runoff. Runoff is when the water that doesn't soak into the ground washes downhill and picks up pollutants and anything else in its path on its way down to a nearby body of water. The pollutants end up in the water and affect the water habitat in bad ways. We did an experiment in class that shows how runoff happens. This is what we did. First we made a mini landscape out of scrunched up newspaper and a trash bag in a plastic bin or box. We spray the whole thing with a spray bottle filled with some water that we dyed blue with food coloring. We added paper towels on the top and to represent chemicals and other trash that gets washed down as runoff, we put two drops of red food coloring on the mini landscape and sprayed it again. Then we watched as the red food coloring traveled down with the water into the little puddle that was forming at the bottom of the experiment. This experiment showed us that pollutants travel quickly and are hard to get rid of. Water always travels down. This is because of gravity. When it rains, water falls everywhere, but it all flows downhill into a nearby lake, pond, stream, or river. The end of a river where it flows into the ocean is called a delta. The water of a delta is usually brackish, which means that the water is partly salty, partly fresh. All the pollutants that were washed down into water through runoff eventually end up in the ocean. Precipitation is probably the part of the water cycle that everyone is most familiar with, but you might not have known how much precipitation affects the environment. As we mentioned before, glaciers contain the most fresh water on Earth. The second biggest source of fresh water is from aquifers. When it rains, some of that water that lands on the ground percolates or trickles down through the ground. 
The water continues traveling through the ground until it hits an impermeable layer, a layer of rock or clay that the water cannot travel through. An aquifer is the saturated soil above the impermeable layer. The world is very fortunate to have aquifers and groundwater, but the only problem with us humans using it is that we are exhausting the world's prime water resource. Take the largest aquifer in the world, for example. The Ogallala Aquifer stretches out over eight of the western states. It is now being used by cities, industries, and for agriculture. And the rate of water removal far exceeds the natural rate of replenishment. And only 10% of what is being withdrawn can be restored by rainfall. Let's go take a closer look at how we get our precious water.